Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and my fellow members of the Royal Geographical Society, I believe that concludes our lantern program at this time. I feel certain that our speaker for tonight needs little introduction from me. Therefore, let me hasten to present England's own hero of the Antarctic, Captain Robert Falcon Scott. I do not think human beings ever came through such a month as we have had to come through. Uh, and we should have succeeded in spite of the weather, except, except for the... I can't make my hands... I can't move the pencil. Captain Scott! How am I to write if I can't move the pencil? Scott, what's the matter? What? Are you ill, man? Are you indisposed? No, uh, no, I just... my hands. Really, this is most irregular. The members are waiting. They're... Waiting. We're all waiting. To hear. Ah. Oh. To hear? About the race. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Everyone loves a race. Mustn't disappoint them, Scott. So many wanting to know. It's just my hands, don't you see? And only if I might rest now for a bit, because I'm so frightfully tired. Not now, old man. After. After, yes. Afterwards I may rest. But my hands, I can't feel the pencil. And what this fellow says, says, there isn't much time. I have to tell you about the most extraordinary place I've been. The things I've seen there are terrible and wonderful. Flames exploding in air. Mountains of crystal. Colors falling from the sky. Yes. Silence. Like a scream into wind. Silence like sleep. Like sleep, yes. Like a dream. So many things to tell. But my hands... The captain has, I believe, a most unusual and uh, most important announcement to make to us at this time. And so now, without further ado, I give you Robert Scott. My fellow members of the society, we are all engaged, all of us here in this room tonight, in a great scientific race in which our national pride is at stake. No human footprints have yet appeared at the South Geographic Pole. When they do first appear, and I assure you that day is very close, I intend that they shall be British footprints. My new ship, the Terra Nova, will steam down the Thames on the morning of May 30th, and her destination is Antarctica. I am going back. I am going to try a second time. And this time, I shall not return until I've planted the Union Jack on the bottom of the earth. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, no journey ever made with dogs can approach that glory which is realized when a party of men go forth to face hardships unaided, and by days and weeks of splendid physical exertion, succeed in solving some problem of the great unknown. Our final victory over Norway will be all the sweeter, all the nobler, because we will know we've taken the prize by playing the game as it ought to be played. Success is a bitch. Grab her and have her, but don't stand under her window with a mandolin. The explanations I have to go through, the flag waving, even at the society. They call themselves scientists, but for three years now their stinginess has frustrated my efforts to open a whole new continent for science. For science? What can that possibly have to do with you? A strange science? To tell you a thousand pound sled can be manhauled across 1600 miles? I consult a chart and a caloric table. It tells me on the 80th day of my journey, according to precise schedule, the seventeenth animal must be converted to protein, and that is science. Of a certain kind, perhaps. Two methods, one goal. 
Most men squander their chances. Their lives pass as if they had slept. At the end of a vague sadness. Then. But you and me. How many in the world like us say? We concentrate. We wait. For what? One place. One turning. The pattern revealed. Suppose we could stand on another planet, English, and see our whole lives at once. How like another planet it must feel to stand at the bottom of the Earth. And what a moment to be there first. Oh yes, how many lifetimes would we give for that? You and me were the same, man. But you act like a fine gentleman, and I'm only a filthy barbarian. A killer of dogs. I said nothing of the kind. A foreigner, then, is the same thing to you don't play the game. Oh yes, the English game. By which you mean that peculiar love affair between your race and man's best friend. Shall I tell you a little secret? It's only the big ones I shoot. With the puppies I like to snap off the heads and drink the blood. I don't find you very amusing. Do you know precisely what I mean? Do I? Oh yes. You're angry because I swore to take the North Pole and leave the South. Yes, damn it. You betrayed my trust for the shabby little advantage of a few weeks' head start. You lied to me in front of the whole world. It wasn't a lie. I meant what I said, for as long as it was convenient. Oh, but I did want the North, more than you've ever wanted anything in your life. From the time I sat in the firelight and listened to the tales of huge ice caps, where perhaps the gods still walk the earth. But you see, the American beat me there. Know what it is to see a dream strangled in newspaper cuttings? No. Well, I can't see the point of being the second man in history to reach the North Pole, can you? I'm going south, English. You're at liberty to try. A decent sense of courtesy towards a brother explorer is more than I have any right to expect. Think of it as a sporting gesture, Scott. Just a bit of healthy open air competition. Isn't that part of playing your damned game? As for the dogs, I won't apologize for common sense. A husky is 50 pounds of dinner hauling you along until you need to eat it. There are rules, codes, standards among civilized men. One doesn't cease behaving properly simply because one is entering a wilderness. All the more reason to set an example. You'll never understand you're not English. But I do understand. Playing the game means treating your dogs like gentlemen and your gentlemen like dogs. You're an infant tickling yourself with a razor. Listen to me, English. Success is a bitch. You can grab her and have her if your plan is right, and that's all. Not because you made her swoon with your virtue, so learn the passion for details. That's not so romantic, but it can keep bread in your belly and your backside out of the snow. Amundsen, wait! Amundsen! I will wait, in the one place that I can afford to wait for a man as determined as you. In the meantime, think of the details. Give us some tea, my blood's turned to ice. That line of clouds, you've seen them. Yes. Storm heads. They're too early for this season. I've never seen such clouds. Yes. Well can't think of everything. Between the far edge of the plan and the near edge of danger, there's always just that tiny crack of luck. So narrow you could barely drive a man's hand into it. He had no right to keep it to himself. It doesn't make any sense. Why should it? This cold, so hard on the sick man, he never heals. First frostbite, then gangrene. Snow blindness. Exhaustion. Really, it's an extraordinary place. It wants so much for you to be dead. I struck him. I can't believe I struck him. He behaved like a fool. But I had no right. A sick man and a petty officer at that. Which bothers you more? That you struck him or that he's going to die? Tough in your heart, English. You know it has to be done. Yes, I must leave him behind. Of course. Not when he's still walking. Not tomorrow or the next day, but soon. Easier for him than you. Maybe he won't wake at all. The others slipping away before dawn. He's 
rolled warm in his sleeping bag. He doesn't see or hear. He feels nothing. He wakes at noon, the silent tent, the empty miles around. But the others saved. One lost, but the others saved. And peace for him. It must be done. Yes, it must. And I want to do it. And I want to. For myself. For my own sake. Yes, for my own sake. Well, where is it written that a general should stop a bullet for a private? That's against all rules of strategy. It's finally only a common sort of oath, too clumsy even to avoid spearing himself. What? One sick man is sacrificed for the good of many. Don't worry, there's no danger of any stain on your reputation. Might even seem a greater hero than ever. You disgust me. For speaking common sense, you're thinking a miracle will come along. It's still only his hand. He just needn't haul anymore. And when he can no longer walk, what then? Then we'll put him on the sled and drag him. For God's sakes, English. That sleigh weighs 1,000 pounds already. Now, the weight of a big man? If not for your ridiculous pride, you might have dogs to drag it. Instead of cripples. When he slows you down so much you can't reach your supplies, will you even drag him then? If we must. He is one. You are four. That makes no difference. The difference between living and dying? Should I just shoot him then, like one of your dogs? Damn it, perhaps we could eat him as well, just to be absolutely logical. It's my fault he's here. Can't you see I'm responsible for his life? For many lives. There's one way to live here, one only. Everything is a tool, a boot, a sled, a dog. And a hand, and arm, even a man. If it breaks down, you throw it away and you march on. It's brutal, yes, and it's ugly. But anything else is sentiment and it will kill you. There's a wall. I can see myself approaching it from a great distance. And at last I come to it. On this side, I'm something like myself. On the other side, I'm lost. I have no name. Can't you understand? Where is the point at which the entire thing becomes... Worthless. After one man dies? After two? Then turn back now. No? I never thought you would. Easier to wait. Easier not to decide. God, these winds. They come across 5,000 miles, nothing to interest or slow them up along the way. For the simple pleasure of burning my face. I have one duty to the nation, another to these men. Are they no longer the same? You have a selfish ambition as well. God help me. I don't know any longer which I place the highest. Duty, honor, sacrifice. All very nice on the full bill. But what is a leader if he can't locate his duty above his own ambition? A man, such as other men, he outshines the angels. He kills his brother for a scrap of bread. Oh yes, English. You will too when your time comes. I'm not capable. If I were, I shouldn't want to live myself. English. You don't even know who you are. You've learned every single rule, but not one dark corner of your own heart. You're the most dangerous kind of decent man. Think of the fox with his leg caught in a steel trap. He'll gnaw through his own flesh for the chance to save his life. Become the fox. Feel the metal grinding into bone. Smell your own hot blood running. Then ask yourself, which is it you really love most? The leg or the trap? How do you like your game now, English? Where will you find the rules? In myself. That's a large enough space to explore? It's all you've left me. No proud speeches now? Disappoint me, English. You've changed. You've softened. No, on the contrary. I'm always with you now. You and I are married together now like one person. We have both been to the pole. Those strange colors. Yes. The Aurora Australis. Of course, the southern lights. I've always wondered what they must be like. Radiant energy released in the high atmosphere. They almost seem to sway with the breezes. 
very beautiful, aren't they? Flames exploding in air, colors falling from the sky. Form, color, movement, mysterious and brief as life. We used to watch the Northern Lights as children. To me, these are far more awesome. The ancients, you know, considered these lights to be mystic signs and portents. The fiery handwriting of the gods. Did they consider them good luck or bad? Well, I suppose that depends on whether you were an ancient optimist or an ancient pessimist. Then how should we consider them? Ah, we of course must pretend to be modern men, with no time for such gaudy superstitions. But they remind me that we live on a very small planet. We'll never have the answers to some questions. For instance, the question, what is it that keeps this man walking? Heavens. Look at him. His hands are swollen to lumps. The fingernails are all dislodged. Fluid streams constantly down his legs and freezes there in seconds. His ears are lost. The tip of his nose. The mind is clouded, dull, stupid. Then how is it this creature is still able to put one foot in front of the other? Home. Home. The thought of home keeps him moving. All of us. The people we shall see there, the things we'll do. Memories. I can't... I can't decide whether it's good to let them dwell on it. It gives them an incentive, yes, but sometimes. It also makes them tense and moody. I suppose, though, that nothing I could say or do could possibly stop them from thinking of home. I tell you true English. It would have been kinder to put a bullet through his head. No use to try and give him a proper burial. The ground's like granite. Scott. We'll leave him where he lies. In time, the snow and ice will cover him, and the wind be his true marker. Scott! What? Get up. Yes. For two weeks since Evans died, you've walked as if you slept. Now the men are dying on their feet. Get up and march, Scott. Yes, must keep marching. Only 40 miles left now. The stench of gangrene is in the tent. Oat's feet are destroyed. Bowers is snow blind. Only forty, do you hear me? By God, I've almost got them home. The sky is darkening. If the storms come now, you'll be finished. Oats is slowing you down just as Evans did. You must make a decision. Oats hasn't marched fifteen hundred miles to die here. Not like this. Not when we're so close. You took Evans, but you won't take Oates. Oates! Oates, come back! Oates! Oates! Titus. You brave man. His body will never be found. What have I done? I slaughter them one by one. No time for pity. Least of all for yourself. It's over, isn't it? All but the last bit. While there are players left on the field, come, Scott. Don't you want to play? I'm very tired. Play the game. No. Play the game. I don't give a damn anymore. Leave me alone. You wish you didn't, but you never had any choice. You are who you are. It was my own choice that brought us here. My own choice that rejected the dogs. That kept us from turning back when we could. But not to cut the hand. Not to kill the oats. You won't deny me the choice that still left me. My own choice, even now. You only have 40 miles to save. I can do the arithmetic as well as you. It's bitter but simple. Paraffin for four days, food for six. The last depot and the relief party are eight days away at this pace. We're just too weak, too slow. What is food next to the spirit? man dies when he stops wanting. We all know it. We've known it since Evans, I think. Only no one will say it. We walk in silence because any sound we made would be a shout of despair. We turn our faces against the darkness. We grope for the pulse of our hearts and feel an idiotic pride that they're still throbbing. In the night we huddle together for warmth, but touching, we're still alone. Still alone. Last, I think you begin to understand the game. Help me. Help me. 
There's no help I can give you. They weigh so heavily. All the other lives. You have strength enough. This... That's for men who have no choice. Not the pole, but here. But the single moment you were born to live, one place the pattern revealed. Not the pole, but here. Yes. You feared life had passed you by, that you couldn't keep pace with younger men. And yet, you see, it's the younger men who are falling by the wayside are still strong. You thought it was a kind of death at the pole. Yet I tell you, you are never so alive as now, and the moment you were born for is here. Live it well. Wednesday, 21st March, the 141st day. We've dragged forward, Birdie and Wilson and I. God knows how we've done it. We're only eleven miles from safety now. It might as well be a hundred for all the strength we have left. And to make matters worse, a terrible blizzard has pinned us down here. I'm proud to say no more has been mentioned of the drugs. Purdy, Bill, are you awake? Uh, good. Dear Mrs. Bowers, dear Mrs. Wilson, if this letter is ever found... I'm afraid it will reach you after one of the heaviest blows of your lives. I write when we are very near the end of our journey, and I am finishing it in company with two gallant gentlemen, to one of you a son, to the other a husband. As our troubles have thickened, they have remained splendidly hopeful, believing in God's mercy to you. If any blame can be attached, let it rest on my shoulders. My whole heart goes out to you in pity. Yours, R. Scott. Message to the public. The causes of the disaster are these. Far away on the great ice shelf, your bodies lie still where they fell, perfectly preserved, fresh as life, magical. You who are so afraid of aging. And every year as the shelf builds itself outwards, you move a few feet closer to the edge where the great chunks of iceberg break off into the sea. One day, a great crystal barge will break away and carry you off, Scott, like a Viking king surrounded by his lieutenants. Then together you'll sail northwards at last into warm seas, into the sun again, north towards home. For my own sake, I do not regret this journey. We took risks. We knew we took them. Things have come out against us, and therefore we have no cause for complaint. Had we lived, I should have had a tale to tell of the hardihood, endurance, and courage of my companions, which would have stirred the heart of every Englishman. These rough notes and our dead bodies must tell the tale. It seems a pity, but I do not think I can write more. Last entry. For God's sake, look out after our people.